Boeing coordinated the work of Project Apollo's many contractors who were building the rocket and spacecraft that took the first humans to the moon. And over the last decade, Boeing has managed the assembly of the International Space Station, built by 16 different countries and put together while in orbit around the Earth. Large systems integration is our unique advantage. In 1933, Boeing debuted the all-metal Model 247, the world's first modern airliner. The wood and canvas that most planes have been made of since the first days of aviation became a thing of the past. Boeing's 787 Dreamliner would not be made out of metal, but out of fiber-reinforced plastic. It is an advanced variation of composite. It's made of lightweight carbon fibers, fabricated into thin layers and infused with a glue. The combination is much stronger than either ingredient on its own, 10 times stronger than its weight in steel. It's the biggest change ever in the history of commercial aviation, by far. But before the designers and engineers in Seattle could begin the multi-year effort to build such a revolutionary aircraft, the Boeing company had to figure out how to pay for it. What was new with the 787 was outsourcing not just production, but R&D, the actual expense of creating a new plane. Basically you say, this is an idea of what we're looking for that needs to fit in here, go design it for us. But we decided that we wanted uh, our supply chain to pay for some of the engineering so that we didn't have as big a bill. Companies around the world were chosen to engineer and manufacture large sections, including the nose from Spirit in Wichita, Kansas, center fuselages from Alenia in Italy, forward fuselages and wings from Mitsubishi and Kawasaki in Japan. These partners would take on the responsibility and expense of designing the sections and creating new tools, facilities, and production processes. The most ambitious innovation Boeing and its partners introduced was the process of spooling long strips of carbon fiber onto what are essentially enormous robotic tape dispensers that lay the material down in precise, complex patterns. It takes the shape of specific parts, like a wing or a fuselage, and then the huge sections are transferred into a massive sealed chamber called an autoclave, where they are hardened under heat and pressure. If you think about a fuselage barrel, in a plane like a 787, there's as many as nine people sitting across in a row. So it, it's a pretty wide object. Imagine that I have to cure it under heat and pressure. It's like, how would I describe that? Imagine putting an airplane in an oven. Out of these giant autoclaves come pre-built sections of the plane that once would have required hundreds of aluminum sheets, tens of thousands of rivets, and countless man hours to assemble. If you look at the way we built the 707 back in the 50s, and you look at the way we build the 787, it is amazingly different. It is off the charts different. Boeing's strategy of giving companies around the world a stake in the 787 promised to lower Boeing's costs, but also to help sell the plane. The strategy worked. Japan was the first foreign country to build the wing of a Boeing plane, and the first to place orders for a Dreamliner. Airlines were promised the new planes would be ready beginning in 2008, but Boeing was selling a design and not a finished airliner. For years, Boeing has had whole sections of its 737 built in Kansas and sent by train to the main assembly facility in Washington state. But parts of the 787 were coming across oceans and from four different continents. There's actually a guy that I worked with who said, well, we're either gonna ship that over in giant ships and we have to build a harbor right next to the factory and get it into somehow into there, or we could just fly it in. We've got a 747, why not 
rework the 747 so that it can fly other airplanes inside of it, <laughs> uh, which is the most incredible and ostentatious idea. Four of these customized 747s, called Dreamlifters, with their enlarged bodies and swing tail, circle the globe, picking up the tails, fuselage sections, nose sections, and wings, delivering these parts to assembly facilities in the United States, one in Everett, Washington, and a second built in Charleston, South Carolina. Other large parts, such as engines and landing gear, arrive by land and sea. The parts come together already pre-stuffed um, with all of the systems and the wiring. And with these sections arriving, you think, boy, that's, that's astonishing. There's so much in there. Three, maybe four million parts coming from countries across the globe. Boeing's vision was they were going to be the assembler, the system integrator, pulling in parts from this global network of suppliers and that Boeing would be able to, quote, snap together a 787 in three days. This was without doubt the biggest challenge any aerospace manufacturer has ever undertaken. Boeing had good reason to believe it could succeed. During World War II, airplane parts from all over the country were assembled under extreme deadline pressure into the most complex machine that had ever been built, the B-29 bomber. And during the Cold War, Boeing coordinated the work of Project Apollo's many contractors who were building the rocket and spacecraft that took the first humans to the moon. And over the last decade, Boeing has managed the assembly of the International Space Station, built by 16 different countries and put together while in orbit around the Earth. Large systems integration is our unique advantage. Not many other companies in the world can take all of these technologies and put it into a system that performs safely and at, at the performance requirements that had been promised originally and can be replicated at high volumes. That's the hard part. With a supply chain that was truly global, with far more responsibility in the hands of their suppliers than ever before, with untried methods of manufacturing, and a suite of new technologies on board. Problems building the 787 were almost inevitable. One in aerospace should only pick on so many different challenges. Today, I think they look back and say, oh my god, I can't believe we did as many different things to this aircraft. Executing a project of such complexity proved to be more than some suppliers could handle. Wrinkles were found in the composite skins from one supplier. Fasteners were incorrectly secured on sections of the tail. There were gaps between units that were supposed to fit tightly together, and some sections arrived at the assembly facility unfinished. We had our partners, and then they had partners who had partners. Uh, it was very challenging and added a lot of complexity. Boeing began to realize that they'd bitten off more than they could chew. And it was not just the suppliers who were struggling. Just days before the scheduled first flight of the 787, Boeing discovered a flaw in its own design. Higher than expected stress where the wing joined the fuselage would force redesign work and further delays. And with a tightly packed schedule that was absolutely delicate, once you get one disruption, it starts to cascade. So you had this chaos building. The company's strategy to better manage the enormous expense of new airplane development was failing and the Dreamliner was still far from a viable airplane. Boeing was facing delays, penalties, and damage to its reputation. There were things we just took for granted, and then we realized these partners don't actually know that. They don't know how to do it. They don't have the experience. That was true even for longtime Boeing suppliers like Mitsubishi which was building the wing for the 787. 
Boeing actually built the first wing in Seattle. And they brought the Japanese in and showed them how to do it and said, OK, go back to Tokyo and build it that way. But making that wing, it's not just building the pieces and putting them together. It's putting the systems into the wing and handling a whole supply chain around that. It was something, even Mitsubishi, a, a very, very competent manufacturer in its own right, had never actually done that before. So they ran into problems. Of course they ran into problems. Soon the Dreamliner was on a path to being three years behind schedule, an unprecedented delay in Boeing's history. And Ray Connor was tasked with leading a team to fix the supply chain problems. The perseverance of that team was phenomenal. And of our supplier team too. We started over. Thanks for watching. Did you like this video? Then show your support by liking, subscribing, and ringing the bell to never miss videos like this.